Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I uh, told you about a couple of dreams I had had a couple of days ago, and I was going to wait until I had some confirmation of them. And if I didn't, well, then my suggestion to you that if the Lord hasn't given you clear confirmation about something, that you know in your heart that what dream or vision you've had actually has come from the Lord, and it's my suggestion that you not say anything about it. And uh, <coughs> that's, that's the way I'm going to take this. You can take it whatever way you want to. That's on you. Me, I've learned over the years that uh, a lot of these things you cannot allow yourself to trust. We don't know the extent of the power of the enemy, all right, to get us to go off on tangents so it brings confusion and chaos in among the fold. And you have to be very careful that you're not being used as a tool of the enemy to cause that fear-mongering and misleading and leading astray, causing confusion, disturbing the flock, and getting them all bent out of shape. Uh, make sure you're not a channel for that. Had another dream I'm going to hold on to for a while again until I get some confirmation regarding it. So they have actually have received an understanding that's been witnessed to me in the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit. Not just a dream I'm just going to go out here and start blabbing my mouth about. One of the issues about that I've noticed about dreams, when I've had dreams that have come to me and or visions, which sometimes you don't even know it. I was doing those paintings 20 years ago, never even thought about what I was painting as being a vision. I was just painting something that I felt from within myself that I wanted to express on paper, and that's what came out. <coughs> I'm just not one of those super spiritually religious people who look to see mighty visions and, you know, great dreams of which, you know, I just, you know, I'm a little, uh, a little more humble than that, okay? I'm no Mother Teresa, I'm no uh, whatever, prophet of God, just a brother in the Lord, sharing my journey of faith. And I've been seasoned. I've learned to. I've been matured in the spirit, so that I don't go off on tangents by the grace of God. And I stay pretty close to the vest regarding what I share and how I share it, because it's very important that we not just, you know, speak from the sleeve. Okay. Well, it used to be a saying that the, a lot of people. Uh, has to do with the love right off the cuff of the sleeve, or forget what it is, exactly how they say it. But that's, that's how it is. I mean, you, you drop a hat and they're in love. <laughs> okay. I was like that. Okay. We're wearing your hearts on your uh, cuffs, sleeves, something like that. Uh, anyway, I, I do have some things to share with you today, and and I, I, I'm going to try to help you to understand and see something in it regarding our feelings and emotionally in, emotions in the natural realm and that of which we're to be led by in the spirit. Because they're not the same. And <laughs> I don't know if the Word of God hasn't gotten that across to you when Jesus told us if, if a man wants your shirt, give him your cloak also. I mean, who... Okay, in his emotions and feelings, would want to surrender things to someone he didn't even know. Or if a, 
if, if one should slap you in your face, turn your cheek. Now, I know some of you brothers out there are pretty, okay, might have your temperaments under control to the extent that somebody could come up to you and slap you upside your head and you not respond. But I got to tell you, that ain't natural. It ain't natural. You slap me upside my head, I'm going to turn around and wreck, blast you, brother. <laughs> That's the natural reaction. And where is that based upon? My feelings and emotions. Fear. You hit me, I'm afraid you're going to try to kill me. So I'm going to automatically defend myself. Well, that's exactly what Jesus was telling us not to do. And the only way you're not going to respond that way is to die to those actions and reactions. In the natural. So you're not led by your natural emotions and feelings. The natural man. The old man. It doesn't mean that you're heartless. It means you begin to learn how to love with the love of God, not your love, not man's love, not an earthly, natural, sensual affection, but spiritually, which opens up your eyes to see faith working in and among others for the sake of the salvation of their souls. It's a whole different world. It's a whole different issue. You come out of the natural into the spiritual. And you grow in that so that you become matured enough that God is able to use you in that work. So, amen, <laughs> Jesus. Father God, I was reminded the other day, I didn't share it with you, I don't think I did, I'd have to check back over the, probably a week ago, <coughs> or maybe even longer, regarding this issue with my sister, and the moving out of this complex, which I told her I would not be able to participate in. <coughs> well, we went, you know, I, I went through turmoil, having to deal with my emotions in the natural regarding that, to believe by faith that there was something greater at work here than just what I was seeing in the natural and hearing in the natural. Which is why the word says, do not judge a matter by the seeing of the eyes or the hearing of the ears. They're referring to the natural realm. You can't walk by faith in the Spirit of God with what you see and here in the natural realm, you just cannot. It doesn't work that way. So, what did everybody see? Well, Brother Andrew just don't love the brethren. <laughs> or he don't love his sister. Or some issue regarding the natural affection and responses I should have had. Regarding what? My decision not to follow after the people. Which is exactly what we were sharing about regarding the sons of Zadok and the Levites. These people who are Levites are a type, as I've said before, of those who have entered into the inner court. The inner man. Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're a type of that. Because the temple in the natural represents the spiritual body of Christ. There's the outer man, which is the outer court of the temple. Okay? And then the inner man, which is the inner court of the temple. And in the inner man, in that secret place of the heart, is the holy of holies. Well, brothers and sisters, he would not be showing us types regarding the spiritual body of Christ that matched us in the natural and use it in the building of a temple 
so that we would not be able to see the truth of that he's revealing to us in it. And it would not just end there. Every aspect regarding the loaves of bread, on the showbread, on the table, the basin of which they washed their hands, the ministry, the fact that the priest would be washed, baptism, water baptism, before they would put on the robes of righteousness, their robes, okay? This all took place before they entered into the temple to perform, to do service. And then among them, only the high priest, okay, which is the order of Melchizedek, above and beyond those who are in the Levitical priesthood, who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If it shows us a type in the natural temple, there is a likeness of that in the spiritual temple. And all you have to do is read what the Word of God says about the Melchizedek priesthood who are the sons and daughters of God, the hundredfold. And, and, and it's just by coincidence, right? Just by coincidence, we're told that each has been given a measure of faith. And how many measures of faith were given as an example? Thirtyfold, outer court, Natural man. Faith, belief, all right, but still on the outer court. Has not received the 60 fold baptism of the Holy Spirit, inner court, a type of the Levitical priesthood, spirit filled. And the hundredfold who've allowed the seed of faith. Okay, because many of you just ain't going to catch on to this. Okay, there is a faith of which is on the outer court, the outer man, which is what we consider to be religion. But nonetheless, if it's from the heart, okay, we walk down that journey in order to have our eyes open that we might be able to see the truth of what's taking place. But what usually takes place, amen, Jesus is that after a number of years, as with myself, in that walk of faith, believing in the work and will of the Father to transform me from inside and out, even though I could not see that happening because I was a miserable wretch. That's what I saw about me in my life, even on to death, turning away from our lives Hating it, that's what hate means, to turn away. We talked about that. Love means to turn to. Hate means to turn away from. Hating their lives even on to death. Now that, for many, could be right until the day that they go into the grave, but it can also represent the type of the death to the old man and the crucifying of this flesh nature. We've shared that before. So what happens is, the seed of faith, the outer man, the religious pretense, even after the receiving of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, were growing and maturing. What is growing and maturing? The seed of righteousness that came forth from the seed of faith. You see, you don't see Abraham and the household of faith as the children of God, of which we first come into. And it's that seed that grows into a stalk, okay, and matures so that it falls from the stalk, natural living life in this realm, into the ground and dies, which is what? A picture of the death and burial of Jesus which takes place in our lives. Just as natural Israel, which Jesus is very much the fulfilling, okay, of all the prophecies of natural Israel right up until the day of which he's crucified, and those are all prophesied of what would take place of that seed of faith. And what happened to that seed of faith? 
it fell into the ground and died. So in our walk, we too, in a like manner, and I've shared this in another way, Jesus came as the second Adam, not the first. The first Adam has been fallen, he's in the darkness, okay? The soul, which has to be washed and regenerated, and when it has been washed and regenerated by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the true water washing and cleansing, which is symbolically shown to us by John, and he himself said, greater is he who comes after me. Well, the baptism that comes after the water washing is greater than the water washing. The water washing is symbolic. But nonetheless, amen Jesus, it's the second Adam. When you've been regenerated and washed, now you're in the second Adam. And it was the second Adam who laid his life down. Just a minute. What you're missing is the picture of our being dead. You're just not seeing that. You've got to accept and see yourselves as having been dead. Just like God said, the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. And every soul has sinned, therefore every soul must die. And we are born in sin and inequity, in disobedience and darkness apart from the light of God and in that sense relative to the light we are dead dead in our sins and trespasses now many of you say well I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit okay I, I went to a symbolic clique where, you know, it represents our dying, okay, the death, burial, and resurrection, where we're dumped down and we come back up in the newness of life. But don't kid yourself. <laughs> this ain't no magic show. It's a process. It's a work that literally takes place in us and through us. And it don't happen overnight. Or the very second you receive the water baptism. We walk by faith, believing in these things which sound doctrine has taught us will indeed take place in us and through us. And there's no question about that. It does take place. To the degree of which that measure of faith in you that you've been given will allow you to walk in. I wanted to mention something about God's uh, love, 555. God is love, 555. You know, I, 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 I mentioned her some months ago in a video, and I, 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 at that time she was doing some basic fundamental uh, uh, sound doctrine teachings. And I don't know where she's gone off to now, okay? She's got wormholes of which the kingdom of heaven is going to come rather than the kingdom of heaven being right here, right now. Okay, I don't understand where she's gone to, but I, I can tell you this. Many times this is how they take you in. They will bring you in in that false covering, all right, of sound doctrine. And then after you're in... Believing that 
they're speaking the truth in love, all of a sudden, we got wormholes. And unless she repents and turns away from that stuff, I suggest that you get away from it because she's sharing a mixed cup ministry. She is still cardinally minded. She has not matured spiritually. She is not seeing the truth, which is what I tried to help you to understand. It's not... How else can I say it to you? The will of God that all things work together for the good during the period of time that all things are working together, okay, may not be the good. It's the working together to bring about the good. And during that period of time, it's not the Father's will that the good be done. So in the big picture, You've got to sit down and say to yourselves in your hearts and before the throne of God, Jesus, why would everything be like it is in these households of faith regarding these different mixed cup ministries and everything else that's going on? Why would he allow that to take place? There's got to be a reason. So, You've got the devil, you've got your own nature, and you've got the will of God. These things are working themselves out in us and through us individually and collectively. This is how I'm able to have love for my brother, the wheat in the 30-fold outer court, who are still in among Okay, the tears. These things have to start to make sense to you. You have to be able to start to see the uh, logi, logic, understanding, knowledge, spiritually which helps to reveal what's taking place in the natural realm. what happens is we get caught up in the natural realm we catch an attitude about oh they're just a bunch of whores and harlot that's the whore and harlot church and forget about the wheat in there well they're not my brothers well they most certainly are and they're exactly where God wanted them to be and you're a liar I know it because I went through the same thing I felt the same way. Then, when I died, that seed of faith of which I had walked in fell into the ground and died. I let go and finally gave up. God rose me back up again. Spiritually. So these things have to take place in your life. Just as they have been taking place for the body of Christ as a many-membered body for the past 2,000 years. Death, burial, and resurrection on the third day. The dawning of the third day. These are the three days in the belly of the whale which are likened on to Jesus' three days in the earth. The belly of the earth. Which is also likened on to one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. These things have to line up and come into harmony with one another. So are you actually seeing the revelation of the body of Christ and not vainly imagining that God has shown you in one scripture or one verse the revelation. Because that is not the revelation. It's simply an unveiling that the Holy Spirit does for us so that we begin to mature spiritually from the inner man. It's not the revelation. The revelation of 
the body of Christ is so far beyond our ability to be able to even comprehend it that when in on that third day that brightness and that light shines forth from us, it transforms us from mortal to immortal beings. It's way beyond anything any one person can contain and it is most definitely the hidden manna of which we felt feast upon as the enemy surrounds us. But what you're receiving is only in part. It's not the fullness. Amen, Jesus. Forgive me. Uh, so, what I was going to share with you is what has happened now. Okay? Finally, we've gotten to the point where my sister has accepted and understood that I was not going to help her. As a result of that, she realized, okay, that what little help she was going to be able to get, unfortunately, from her daughter or son-in-law up in Phoenix, okay, was uh, going to be better suited for her to just go ahead and hire a professional moving company to come in and move her out. Now, I will do everything I can inside of that apartment to make that work go as quickly as possible because she's charged like $85 an hour, okay, to do this. So we're going to go over there probably Monday night because they're going to come on Tuesday and I'm going to break down the bed that I helped to build. Okay. Everything that's gone on with my sister for the past year, I've been intimately involved with. Laying down my wants and desires. I get up every morning at 6.30 in the morning and go take some dogs for a walk that aren't even mine. Okay. It's not a boasting or a blowing of the trumpet. It's simply trying to help you to see that what you guys understand is love pales in comparison to the love of God that works in us and through us towards one another once we're willing to lay down our wants and desires. You've got to die so Christ can live through you. It's not a vain imagination or something you think you'd like to be able to do. It's either a reality or it's not. It's the living word. And that's faith, the works of faith, is the outcome of that realization actually taking place in your life towards another. So by the grace of God, amen, Jesus. One of the things that was, uh, was reminded of uh, last week, and I didn't share with you, like I said, I don't remember sharing it with you, was my concern, now that my sister is no longer has a husband, and he's passed away, she's 66. She's partially disabled. She's lost a leg, but she has a prosthesis, and she gets around pretty good. She has her bad days, but most of the time, she's 66, and a healthy 66, and gets around pretty good. But that wasn't the issue. My concern was, because I've got this work. God has brought me here to do a work. And that work will be done. And that's my first and most important responsibility. is my obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the will and the work of the Father. Now I know some of you may say, oh geez, that's awful. You'd let your sister go. So that's right. That's what Jesus said. If you're not willing to turn away from mother, brother, sister, and for my name's sake, then you're not worthy of me. Pray that you be found worthy, brothers and sisters, to enter in. <laughs> so, as I've said, by the grace of God, I remembered mentioning to my sister and thinking to myself some time ago, before even this issue came up about the move, that knowing what I know regarding what the work and will of the Father is in my life, and how much time now for the past six months or a year I have taken away from, although I have been grateful for, because it helped to give me something else to do besides 
sit here waiting upon the Lord, which I've been doing for two and a half, three years. All right? Amen. It's been, it's, you, I've shared that before too. You don't know how tough it is to work your whole life and then sit down and do nothing. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's harder than anything else. Just to do nothing. But nonetheless, by the grace of God, and fulfilling a work and a need in my sister's life in relationship to the salvation of her soul, which is the most important thing to me, whether or not she goes by way of the grave or whatever takes place with her in the natural, it's not nearly as important to me as my sister's salvation. So in order to see the work of the hand of the Father in a person's life, You've got to come out of yourself to see in the Spirit. So I was concerned. Is she going to be able to handle being on her own? Alone? Because most of her life, adult life, since the time she was 18, has been married. Two husbands. My first brother-in-law for 12, 13 years. And then about six months to a year later, a year and a half maybe, the second marriage was lasted for 30 years. She's never really been on her own alone. Now I know what the work and will of the Father is in my life regarding what's getting ready to take place. And that my life is devoted to that work. So I'm not going to be able to be over there with my sister. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And if, it, if, she's to get, if that's the extent of the help that she needs, then we need to be looking for a nursing home for her. Not a place to live on her own. But we had already determined my sister is nowhere near that. So to get her out of her lethargy and to get her to stand upon her own two feet I speak that relatively speaking. <laughs> the two feet she's got, amen, Jesus. Somebody had to get out of the way. And guess who that somebody that had to get out of the way was? Me. My sister has to be able to stand on her own in her relationship with the Father. I cannot be there with her 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And I will not be there. So what the Father did in His mercy and grace towards me and His love was to separate me from that so I could see that my sister was indeed going to be all right on her own. And it had to start right here, right now. In this move. Because if she can do this, then there ain't nothing else that she needs to have me do for her. And she's quite capable of handling her life in her home on her own. Now maybe some of you will begin to see the truth of the work of God in this situation of which I was obedient to that you could not see before. I pray that's true. I pray that it helps you to begin to see other things in your own life. What you've interfered with perhaps many times was the work and will of someone else's life. Having them be put to death and you at the same time. Because you don't experience of death to self until you deny the desires to want to do something in the natural. When you desire, deny your desires, your emotions, your feelings to do and act upon something in the natural realm, you are putting yourself to death. That's what picking up your cross daily means. So there is so much more uh, that has not been revealed nor taught to you. And many of you are sitting here still in denial. You deny the truth of the Word of God written there 
and ignore the truth and the reality of that word and that truth being spoken of relative to us. We're that whore until we're not. We're that Pharisee. We're all of those things. The beast nature. We're all of it. And that's what God has been delivering us from. Until you see that, you're of absolutely no use to God whatsoever. Now, according to the Word of God, brothers and sisters, the deception... We're at the end. If you believe we're at the end, then you need to learn to accept this truth. In the end, the deception would be so great that if it were possible, even the sons and daughters of God would have been deceived. That means everyone except for the sons and daughters of God has been deceived. You are deceived. You've been deceived, lied to, led to believe a false gospel of heaven and earth, and you have not separated yourself wholly unto God. That's why it's called the in part ministry. It's only been done in part. Now, does that take away from your faithfulness, your desire to want to serve God in the full, complete, whole, and perfect will? No. Does that make you less than? No. Accepting the truth of the work and the will of the Father makes you a child of God. Seeing it for what it really is makes you be awakened. You are awakened to the reality. And that's what Satan plays. We are being woken up to the reality of Christ in us and the work and the will of the Father transforming us into the likeness and the image of Jesus Christ. We are just now going to wake up those who are in the inner court who have been awakened and have not fallen back asleep and have been obedient among the Levites are going to receive a double portion so that they can now hear and see what are they going to see? The revelation of the body of Christ unfolding before our very eyes. But you've got to accept that you have not. And stop lying. And what I have been sharing with you is the reality and the truth of that issue which the Word of God has said that in the end there shall be a great falling away. There will have been a great falling away. And I've tried to share with you, brothers and sisters, this is not a end of the days falling away. This is a falling away and having been removed from the foundation of the sound doctrines and teachings that were given to us 2,000 years ago. That's why it's called a great falling away. Because the mass majority, the vast majority, have fallen away. It's the few who find the way. Not the many. And if you've been feeding yourselves on the doctrines and traditions of the many and or your own thinking, whether you're in the assembly or out of the assembly, the same work has to take place for you as it does for them. 
Now we're going to see the corporate body. The restored church of which Jesus now sets upon the bedrock of the Father. The revealed word is the bedrock which he as the wise builder has placed the foundation and the building upon. All of this is going to begin to take place in and among the brethren, brothers and sisters, at least those who are going to be saved out at this hour and not have to go through the tribulation. And I can tell you that is a very few number relative to the entire Christian, so-called Christian faith. Many more will repent after tribulation, after the door has been shut, after those who have been gathered in among the few have entered in, and the wheat... <coughs> And the awakening of the week, there's no guarantee that they're going to do it. We don't know. This is all in God's hands. We know these events are about to take place because the Word says so. That He would cast out His net in the end, gather in the fish, which I've shared with you, fish to me represent the witness of the Holy Spirit. When you read about the two feedings in the parables in Matthew, which are a type of the two folds, Okay, come up a little higher. You've got to start to see things behind the types. That's why they were given to us. That we might see the greater. Not in the natural, but in the spiritual. What is God showing us when he has Jesus sitting down and has two different feedings? Why not five feedings? Why not three feedings? Why not just one? Why two? What of those two can we begin to put together with other such things like this? And the two flocks shall be made one spirit. Why not three flocks? God knows how many flocks have been established. How many flocks has there been? And what flocks is he referring to? Which would be the two most important flocks, do you think, to God? To get to us? So we could understand. The first flock <laughs> used to begin the work, to establish the work, the authorship, and the last flock, the finished work. Two most important periods of time for the church when it was established and now at the end when it's gathered together in the second fold. It's why the name of the uh, channel, my channel, that I got in a dream 12, 15 years ago as a sign that stood up over me said the Messiah's second assembly. We celebrate the event, not the place. Now try to think a little bit outside of the box of what that might mean. <laughs> we celebrate the event. What event? What event should we be looking to have take place? A feast of love. A feast of love. In the banquet hall. The wedding feast. Of which, in the end, which is another two, what did he say about the early wine and the latter wine? The early rain and the latter rain. You can't have these examples being given to you consistently and continually throughout the Word of God and not begin to wake up and see the truth of what's being said. Amen? Come on. Please. So, that's, that's the event. And it's not the place. Because why? why? Why would it not be any particular place? Or household. Or Christ is here or Christ is there. Why would it not be that? And why have we been warned not to go out to those places of which they, oh, Christ is here and Christ is there as a Pacific place. 
Why have we been warned not to follow that? Because it doesn't happen in any one place. It happens worldwide for all of the many member bodies who have cast out the bondwoman, the refiner's fire, the fuller's soap, the threshing of his floor that's getting ready to take place, which is the judgment that takes place first upon the households of faith to clean them out. So either the bondwoman will be cast out with the son of perdition, which is who? Who is the son of perdition? Oh, the son of perdition is the devil. Well, the son of perdition has got some children too, and they're called tares. And we've explained to you who the tares are. <coughs> the tares, what is the difference between <laughs> the lightness and the darkness? <coughs> Forgive me. In the most basic elemental teaching, what is the difference between the light and the dark? A lit candle and an unlit candle. Now on the outer man, you can be just as religious, pagan worship, I don't care what kind of religious that you got, or you can have a false covering Okay, pretending to be something that you're not in the, in the Christian faith. And the word says, more are the children of the bondwoman, the tares, the sons of perdition, the sons of God and the sons, the sons of light and the sons of darkness. The seed of the devil that was planted in God's garden, the household of faith, is God's garden. The outer court of the temple is not the temple. It's the court of the Gentile of which that fullness of the Gentile has been gathered in from. And according to the measure of faith, you have entered into that issue, to that measure. It's not a bad thing. It's the measure that God knew in your heart that you'd be able to be obedient to. So you're just as saved Except for, here's the process, and we've gone over this. I hope this isn't boring to you. I hope some of you are actually picking up something and actually hearing the truth. When we remain on the outer court is as the parable, amen Jesus, of the gardener. And God, the owner of the garden, comes in and sees a tree that hasn't produced a fruit. But nonetheless, that tree is in that garden, isn't it? That's the thirtyfold. The trees that have yet to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What the Word says is, cut it down. And Jesus said, whoa, wait a minute. All right, let me add a little bit of fertilizer to this. Before you go cutting it down. Amen, Jesus? To have it produce the fruit. The fertilizer to me is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And or the sealing, like Jacob's wells. Jacob's wells were dug. The water's in there, but there's a cover over the top of them. What cover might be over the top? of the water of the word of God in them. And then when we read about there are those who would have entered in but the way to enter in has been blocked. Who blocked the way for who to enter in? What is he talking about? These scriptures have to be in harmony with one another. You've got to start to see the spiritual story being told in the natural earthly types, examples. That's where we mature in the spirit. That's the difference between the dead letter, which is nothing more than an earthly example of good moral stories of which you gain nothing on the inner man, but when we learn to dig up the pearls of wisdom beneath the surface, we purchase that whole field. 
Then those pearls of wisdom, which are as precepts, okay, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Then we begin to grow in knowledge, with knowledge gain understanding, with understanding comes wisdom. Where wisdom is, there lies prudence, caution, patience. Well, I've brought you through enough of it at this point that you've got to begin to start to see that when he says he's going to remove the shaft from off of the wheat, he's referring to the false outer covering of the religious pretense of which they now, on the day of redemption, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit which is the washing and regeneration of their souls. The sixtyfold believed by faith in the greater in this life prior to the day of redemption. And they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and have been washed and regenerated, but many of them, the vast majority, have not laid down the second life which is now really life. And for those of you who think laying down death when you receive the baptism is the life that we were to lay down, you're sadly mistaken because it's a contradiction in terms. You don't have true life until after you're born again, after you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then are you alive unto God through Christ Jesus it's that life as the second Adam, the regenerated one, that we were to lay our lives down because you can't lay them down until after you had the power, you've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to put to death the flesh nature and the old man, your old thinking, the cardinal, the earthly, the natural realm. It's that life that is the seed that falls in the ground and dies. So, there is so much more in this that I pray that some of you will at least start to pick up on a little bit. Just a little. Try a little bit to see something more in the Alpha and the Omega then this false impression and understanding that it represents the eternal word because there is no beginning nor end, no alpha, no omega in eternal. Eternal has no beginning and it has no end. He's referring to the beginning, the establishing of the church, the body, here on earth, his body, and the finished work of his body, which is the revelation that was given to John and shown to Paul. And Paul refers to the natural journey of Israel and the events that took place, which are drawn out from that depth of water. Okay? Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice. It's a type. All of these things are as a type to help us to see the greater in that mirrored reflection which they looked into dimly but now at the end in the fullness when that which is perfect, complete, the whole story, page two of the Paul Harvey report for those of you who are old enough to remember, page two is coming. Amen? the transformation from mortal to immortal and our entering in to the barn of God under that anointed covering so that regardless folks kingdom heaven is not outside of our universe it's outside of the natural realm it doesn't e it exists here with us it's sitting right here next to us it's in us, but it's not in this world, not in this realm. 
So when we enter into it at that moment and time, we're no longer apart, even though you might very well see yourselves here, a moment, twinkling of an eye, a period of time is going to pass over us when all of these other things are going to take place in the natural realm and we are not going to be affected by it at all. That's the rapture. That's the being taken out of the way. You don't have to go off into some fairy tale land in the sky it happens right here, right now. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I love you guys. The Lord be with you and bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen.